I have had a request from one of your colleagues here that apparently a couple of you never used ANOVA and actually had quite a dim uh, appreciation of, of what an analysis of variance is. Of course, it takes more than five minutes to explain it, but this is not the first time I've, I've been asked to do the impossible in five minutes. <laughs> so I'll take uh, those five minutes to try and explain the basics of ANOVA. At least, I hope I, I can assume that everybody has already uh, done, run a t-test to test for comparison of means between two groups. Okay, so one way to think about ANOVA is a generalization of this for more than two groups. Okay. So this is one, one possibility. But if you do this, say you have three groups, you try to uh, test for differences among, among means, and you go it naively, you run a t-test for uh, groups one and two, for one and three, and two and three, you get a problem because you have run three tests for the price of one. Each time, with an alpha rejection level of, say, 0 0.05. It's like throwing a dice three times and still thinking that overall you have one, uh, uh, one sixth, a probability of one sixth to get, uh, say, uh, a five. This is simply not true. By repeating the throws, you increase the probability of getting a given value. And repeating pairwise tests when you have more than two uh, means to compare, is like repeating uh, the, uh, the, this dice play. You increase the risk of type 1 error. Globally, you increase strongly the risk of uh, thinking at least once, of, uh, obtaining at least once a significant difference, where in fact it is, there is no significant difference. I'll not go into the details, but this is the point. So ANOVA has been invented to circumvent this by comparing, actually, variances, the, hence the name analysis of variances. But how on earth could you compare variances if your aim is to determine whether means are different? This is done by doing this. Say you have three groups. Within this group, you have uh, several uh, observations with given values of your variable. And you are asking yourself whether this mean or the population, statistical population from uh, where this group has been sampled is different from the mean from this and from this. The reasoning in ANOVA is to say within these groups, you have variance, but this variance you cannot explain by the fact that they come from different groups be, be, because they come from the same. So this variance is residual. It is noise, actually, the equivalent of residuals in a regression. Same here, same here. So this is the basis. That variance within group variance, or is it called in ANOVA, is the basis of comparison. And now the hypothesis. You have the means here, here, and here. And those may be different. Maybe one is different from two of the two others, or the three are different. Uh, it's not important here. Or they may not. If the three groups come from the same population statistic, uh, statistical population, you have those means, those observed means that are slightly different, but not, not too much. Actually, it reflects the same kind of noise that you have within the groups. And so, through the tricks of calculation, I won't go into the details of calculation, of course, now, ponder, um, uh, weighting the means with the appropriate number of, uh, of observations here, you get a measure of the among group variance, so the variance between the means of the groups. And if your null hip hypothesis is true, meaning if those three groups come from the same popula uh, statistical population, then 
the among the among group, which it, it's it's actually an ANOVA uh, F statistic is an among group. Uh, variance divided by within group variance. So if your null hypothesis of equality of means is true, those two quantities are approximately equal. And actually, they are, uh, the sample uh, distribution is like an F statistic. An F distribution looks like this with its uh, mode approximately at value 1. You have 0 here. So if those two terms are equivalent from one group of uh, uh, one experiment to another with uh, your null hypothesis being true, this ratio floats around the one value because those two are approximately equal. In the statistical population, they are strictly equal. Now, if even one of those, you can of course have a lot more than, uh, than three groups, but if even one of those is different from the others, then this term here, the numerator increases because you have more variance among the group means. But since the within group is estimated within each of those bubbles, even if I shift this up, for instance, the within group variance will still be the same. And the consequence of any difference of means becoming uh, important enough to be detected here will be to increase this term. So your F statistic will go here to the right. And uh, I don't know what just happened here. Maybe my uh, computer decided to sleep and uh, the other thing did, didn't like it. Well, and so the consequence is that your F statistic will go up. And so if the difference is, enough, is large enough, you have uh, an among group variance that becomes large enough for the F to cross this uh, critical value where you can reject your null hypothesis. Does it answer your question? Seven minutes. Sorry, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> two minutes over my uh, time. Well. OK, now let's go to the main topic of this uh, second part of my of today's ta talk of me. Uh, we had still that uh, thing. In, in, in several cases, you are with a, now let's go back to the general frame where we have a multiple regression or redundancy analysis, more specifically now that you know. And in some circumstances, you may have to reduce the number of explanatory variables that you will put into your RDA. There can be uh, various reasons for that. One of them being, going back to Michele Scardi's expression, not enough sound ecological thinking at the outset. So uh, you end up with too many candidate explan explanatory variables. In remote times where apparently, uh, well, for, for in, in, in some circumstances, uh, measuring uh, <coughs> rather trivial but possibly potentially interesting variables doesn't cost a lot. So it was a bad habit to simply measure as many variables as possible and then, well, let's throw them into the analysis and uh, statistics will tell, tell us which, uh, which ones are interesting. It's, it's not a, sorry? Uh, you almost do. Okay. Uh, and it, as long as you are in an exp exploratory phase, this may be correct. After that, please uh, go back to what is already known and don't redo the, uh, the science that is already done. So this is, uh, this is a point. But in any case, if, you're, if, you're still, if you do this and it's perfectly legitimate, I, I, I was adding that being quiet. <laughs> I don't add this uh, just because you, t you told this now. But it is perfectly legitimate in, in some circumstances that you have too many variables simply because you are in an exploratory phase of a research. And you go fishing a little bit. It's a dangerous play. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to, uh, game to play. But in any case, it may be legitimate. Sometimes it's not simply because it has been a substitute to unsound uh, or a lack of uh, scientific or ecological thinking in this case. 
In other cases, like the ones we will explore when we go to spatial analysis, especially DB, MEM, MEMs, and so on, uh, we have special procedures like those we use to build our spatial variables that produce many explanatory variables. And here, the name of the game will be to sort out, to identify those that best explain the spatial structures of our data. So here again, instead of using all of them, we'll have to select those that are best, uh, well, the best, uh, that provide the best fit. So this is another and uh, a very frequent use of variable selection. And there are several procedures of selection for ex uh, of explanatory variables. First of all, let's say that no single perfect method exists to reduce the number of variables to select uh, the best or an adequate subset of explanatory variables. Uh, some people go as far as to say that no such method should even be used. But this is extremism, and I won't go into this because we are practici practitioners. We have to deal with our data in some way, and uh, in some cases the procedure itself requires that we select in a clever way the variable that we really need. So this is what we will do now. In multiple regression, uh, univariate multi multiple regression, you may know that uh, usually the three available methods are forward selection, meaning you, you, you start with nothing and you build your model up with the first and the second variable and so on. Backward selection, so re the reverse, you start with the complete model with all the potential variables and then you throw out one by one the one that are the least significant or explain the least, which is uh, basically, uh, well, more or less equivalent. Or then, in multiple regression, there is some tricks of uh, what is called stepwise selection, which, uh, which, is, uh, which combines actually both approaches. It starts with the forward selection, and as soon as there are uh, two variables, it tests if the second has not pr produced an effect that throws the first out, and then it goes back and forth until everything stabilizes. So this is... Uh, basically what you can do in univariate uh, uh, multiple regression. You can also apply two of the three in multivariate uh, uh, regression, meaning RDA, but we'll see the details uh, in a moment. Because the one that is preferred generally is forward selection. For different reasons, reasons one, uh, well, anyway, I'll come back to the principle. Uh, I, I'll explain the principle first, and I'll explain its shortcomings and the reason why, despite those shortcomings, it's still the forward selection that is now preferred. Okay? So the, the, the principle goes as follows. First, you compute in turn, you measure you know, by uh, RDA the independent contribution of each of your m explanatory variables, the candidate variables. So if you have five, you have five RDAs to compute. Those are, uh, of course, only the first uh, part of it, meaning the R-square and uh, the, the associated test. You don't have to, to so, uh, project anything at, at this step. So each time you have only one explanatory variable in your X matrix. Okay? And then you look at those. Of course, there are already probably a couple of them that are not even significant, but among those that are, you select the one that explains most of the variation, so the highest R square. Here, you adjust it or not is equivalent, since in all cases you have only one variable in your set, so the, the adjustment is the same for all the, the R squares. So you choose, uh, basically, you have simply you fish out the one that uh, explains most of the variance and uh, is significant. So this one you enter into your model. It's the first step. And then you go back to the remaining variables. And with the first one already in the model, you, you one at a time, you test the partial contribution, meaning the added R squared provided by each of the remaining variables in turn. 
you have variable three that has been admitted as the first uh, block in your model. So uh, you test three, three plus one, three plus two, three plus four. Three. So so that uh, again you look for the second best variable, considering that the first is already in the model. If you find a couple of them significant, and well, in any case, you, f you, you look at the, uh, at the one that has the highest contribution, new contribution, added contribution to the R square, check whether it is significant or not. This one, not uh, the two together, this one. So the added contribution, and you add it into the model if, if, if it is the case. And you continue, so on and so forth, until nothing more significant emerges. And at this, at this step, you stop your forward selection, and you have got your model. This is a beautiful, nice, and clean story. But of course, it has its dark corners, like every story, uh, or at least any every uh, well, interesting story. First of all, forward selection is too liberal. Nothing to do with politics here, be reassured. In statistics, being too liberal means tend to deem something significant too easily. Uh, another case of being too liberal is, for instance, uh, the example uh, exposed by uh, Pierre this morning when he spoke about problems in uh, regression or, uh, or some tests when you use maybe uh, uh, you have a regression analysis and you apply it to non-normal data and he said that the the true rejection level of your null hypothesis increased okay this is being too liberal and this you cannot do in statistics because you think you have a test at 5% rejection level, meaning you are ready to be wrong one out of 20 tests. And in reality, you are at 10% of or 15 or maybe even more. Yeah, I have in some tests. Hey, I, I spoke about, the, about uh, Bartlett's test of homogeneity of variance this morning, quickly mentioned it. I have uh, run simulations with non-normal data, skewed data, uh, you may have rejection rates up to 80% when you think you are at, uh, at 5, okay? So never use Bartlett's test with non-normal data, the, the parametric one. It skyrockets your rate of type 1 error. So this is way, way too liberal. You can, in no way you can use such a test, and you don't want to. So this forward selection is too liberal. This is the bad news. The semi-good news is that it is the less too liberal from the three. I mean, the uh, backward selection is much more liberal than forward selection. And uh, stepwise is maybe a mix of, of the two. But in any case, all those procedures tend to let, uh, to admit too many variables into a model. This can be checked by simulations with random variables, and you see that they are more than expected under the, the null hypothesis, and so on. And so you, you see that the, the true rejection rate is too high, and you admit too many variables. So this is a problem. And this problem has been addressed in the case of the forward selection we run in RDA in uh, the frame of a postdoc uh, study that has been made by a former postdoc student of Pierre Lejean called uh, Guillaume Blanchet, good friend of us who uh, still works avidly in uh, the field of numerical ecology. And he made that kind of simulations with, with RDA. And we came up with, say, some would say a patch, other, others would say a solution, but in any case, as a way of preventing at least a part of the problem. Well, actually, the part is, uh, is double. Uh, uh, the, 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 the problem is double. There is a problem, an overall problem, of a forward selection procedure finding a significant model, simply finding one too often, maybe even starting with the first variable. And then, even if it is legitimate to have at least one significant variable, the second problem is being 
uh, to that uh, you, uh, you tend to add too many of those variables, so useful, uh, useless ones, those that explain only noise, noise in the models. So those two issues have been tackled uh, separately in uh, Guillaume Blanchet's work. Uh, uh, so he set a couple of guardrails to avoid those problems, or at least to uh, keep them under control. The first of those guardrails is the recommendation before forward selection to always perform a global test, including all explanatory variables. And if and only if this global test is significant, then you can proceed to the forward selection. It may, be, it may seem strange to do that, because after that, we start up with nothing and try to add the variables one after the other. This is because Guillaume observed that even in cases where nothing is significant, if you have, uh, say, a random variables and you try to, uh, to, to, to build a regression model with a couple of candidates random variables, uh, in, uh, in, in a procedure of selection, if you don't start with a global test, which in almost every case will, uh, well, in the, at, uh, given the normal rejection rate, will say that nothing is significant, nothing occurs here, uh, if you directly start with the forward selection, you increase the probability of having at least one entering the model. So uh, this is why you have this first guardrail. Before even trying a forward selection, you take your response matrix, you take your explanatory, your full, complete explanatory matrix, and you run a global RDA test, the first that uh, can be done, the ANOVA uh, name of the object where you have done the, the RDA. You'll see this in the practical this afternoon. And only if this one rejects your null hypothesis, if it is significant, then you proceed to the next step. And then is the second part. Even if the global test is significant, forward selection remains too liberal, meaning this time that it tends to admit too many variables into the model. And for that, the idea that uh, Guillaume uh, tested and developed, and that was eventually published in 2008, was to add a second stopping criter criterion to the selection. In ordinary selection, normal one uh, I exposed before, the simple stopping criterion is the alpha or the, the p-value. I mean, uh, you, you, you add those variables until you have one that exceeds the, the, your alpha level, if you have a p, as long as you have a p-value below 0 or equal to 0 p, uh, point, uh, 0 0.05, for instance, you'll still continue the procedure, and you'll stop it uh, when you, uh, the next candidate variable, the best, the next best candidate variables, uh, cannot enter with a p-value below that alpha level, or equal or, or, or below that alpha level. And apparently this is not enough. So what Guillaume proposed and what we tested and what, uh, what was published is that you go back to the complete RDA, the one you made with all candidate variables. And now you look at the adjusted R-square. You remember that irrespective of the number of variables, though this one is supposed to give you the correct estimation, an unbiased estimation of the explained various variance of your model. Okay? So you take this one. Well, I, I mean, if you, if you begin to have uh, almost as many explanatory variables as you have objects, even uh, the adjusted R squared uh, is not uh, recommended as a patch. Uh, thin out your variables another way. Anyway, in any case, you have your adjusted R squared. This is actually considered in this second <coughs> stopping criterion as the maximum value that can be uh, approached. Because strangely enough, in some cases, you may add up the variables in such a way that the added R square, the adjusted R square during the buildup of your model exceeds the one you have with all the variables. This is because the adjustment takes a, into account the number of variables that you already have in your model. So the ad adjustment is less stringent when you have less variables in your model, which explains, in turn, why this adjusted R-square can temporarily go over the one of the complete model. And this we find not so reasonable. Others may argue, but in 
the simulations that uh, Guillaume ran, it showed that, on average, this provided regression models or uh, RDA models that had not those problems of liberality that tend, on average, to uh, enter, to admit the appropriate number of explanatory variables into the model. There may be cases where you have one or two too many. That, that, that happens all the time. It, it, but but it, on average, it, it, it goes a good way to correct for that situation. So that may be a little bit tricky, uh, explained that way. But of course, all this has also been automated in the procedures that we will run in R. Uh, going further into those notions, of course, in RDA, each of those tests, stepwise tests, forward uh, selection tests, are made by random permutations. So now you know what it is and how this works in RDA. And another point, another of those dark corners of uh, variable selection procedures is that even if you, well, let's say you started with about uh, 15 or 12 uh, candidate explanatory variables, and you find a superb model containing all, all about four of them with an adjusted R square, which is very close to the one with the, uh, with the, the 10 other ones. Okay? This is good. You have, go, uh, have a, a good deal because you have thrown out variables that are not important in explaining variance in your data. And you have a model that is easier to explain, to handle, and that is more parsimonious, which, uh, well, despite uh, what uh, has been told here, is still a good aim to look at when it comes to real explanation of phenomena. If you have less variables that can explain more of the variance, I don't see the use of adding more, uh, no more variables. I really don't see this. This is Occam's razor principle. Okay, But even in this beautiful case where you have a small subset of explanatory variables that explain almost as much variance as the whole set, you don't, you don't have the guarantee that this subset is the best possible one. And no procedure will ever guarantee this. And this is because we are using a sequential procedure here. We first select the first variable that explains most of the variance. But as you know, your candidate expl explanatory variables are not independent in real cases. They are correlated to one another to some extent. So here lurks again that B fraction things uh, you are acquainted with now. But here the point is, since you have put this variable as first and not the one that was immediately came immediately as second, the remaining the variance in the response di data that remain to be explained is completely conditioned by this first variable. If you had chosen another one, then the remaining variance would have been different. And maybe the selection of the second, third, fourth explanatory variable would not have been the same. As soon as you, as you take one, it goes and eats a part of the variance. So the structure of the remaining variance is conditioned by what has been absorbed, explained by this first one. And it goes on with the second, the third, and the fourth. Unfortunately, it's not possible in practical terms to run all possible combinations of numbers and, uh, and uh, of variables. So, so if you have 10 candidate variables, you'd have to test the R square and, uh, of all pairs, and then all triplets, and all possible uh, groups of four and five. Blah, 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 and it, it goes completely out of hand. You cannot do that. So unless you're doing that, you, you, you hire a pop, entire populations of undergraduate students to do that, it's not possible. So you resort to that kind of things. Of course, uh, variable selection, in, uh, e, as I am uh, presenting now to you, is one possible way to go in a large family uh, that can be called model selection, meaning 
you have, if you increase your scope and go beyond regression, you may have other approaches to better model this and that uh, problem. And that, this goes beyond the course, of course. But here, what interests us is what you can do with RDA, and this is uh, forward selection. Again, forward against the two others, uh, backward or stepwise, because it's, although too liberal, not so liberal as the two others. And then, especially now, because we have this second stopping cr criterion based on the global test first and on the global uh, adjusted R-square. So uh, this uh, makes it uh, better suited to our purposes and avoids having really too many variables entering a model. As in all regression models, the presence of strongly intercorrelated explanatory variables renders the regression or canonical coefficients unstable in the sense I have uh, presented to you uh, yesterday or day before. So um, even forward selection does not eliminate this problem. I would even say that uh, if you have two strongly correlated variables, several cases can appear. In your specific case, it's very likely that at least one, well, let's say that the two best candidates are strongly co correlated to one another when you, when you start, okay? Then one uh, of those necessarily, by the sake of uh, the random fluctuation, will explain a little bit more of the R square than the other. And so this one will enter. In another data set taken in the same population statistic, it may very well happen that the other will have entered first. So the fact that y y resorting to forward selection to decide which one of the two is better is, uh, is not appropriate. It, it, it won't give you the correct scientific answer. On average, uh, you are just playing dice with, with this or uh, uh, flip-flop. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it can be one or both. Okay? And after that, even if they are strongly correlated, it may also happen that both enter the model because despite their correlation, they are still independent, the A and C fractions, large enough to explain a significant part of the, of, the, of the variation of the response data. So it's always possible that both enter the model. But still, after that, you will be stuck with a model with a high multicollinearity because of those two being uh, strongly correlated. So don't count on forward selection to avoid this uh, problem. So it can help. But be aware that the choice between the two, if there are two strongly correlated variables, has no a priori ecological validity. It has been made on statistical basis only, and statistics don't t tell you anything about ecology if you, do if you don't have the correct thinking beforehand. This is always very important. Statistics is not... Uh, an intellectual processes. It does not substitute itself to your thinking. And this is very important. In case where you really have several strongly correlated explanatory variables, it may hide something. Some, sometimes uh, may, you don't even see it clearly. Because uh, in some occasions, it's not simply a pair of variables that are strongly correlated, but one variable explains, uh, can be explained commonly by another subgroup, a subset maybe of four or five of other variables that are not necessarily too strongly correlated among one another, but collectively are very uh, strongly correlated to one different variable. This also increases the overall multicollinearity of your uh, explanatory matrix. And this can be checked with what is called the variance inflation factors. Uh, it, it's possible to calculate, to compute those in, uh, for, for an RDA as well. I don't think I have put the code in the practicals, although, but it's in the yellow book for sure. Uh, those variance inflation factors actually measure how much the variance of the regression or the canonical coefficients uh, increase because of the presence of correlation. So it's a mean of measuring the instability of a regression model, uh, meaning that for different data, uh, 
sample from the same statistical population. Uh, if you have this problem, then the co canonical coefficients uh, could be uh, completely different or very different from what they were in their first uh, sample set. And uh, this was already pres present in Kanoko, since a couple of, uh, of you have used uh, Kanoko, uh, that program that uh, Brack wrote to run uh, canonical uh, correspondence analysis. And, uh, long ago uh, already, and uh, he already uh, had that possibility of co computing the VIFs, the variance inflation factors, and as a rule of thumb, uh, Tabrak recommended that variables that have a VIF larger than 20 may be removed, uh, should be removed from the model. So you, you could check this, and before even running, uh, resorting to, to forward selection, it's another possibility. You could do that, remove uh, the most uh, well, one step at a time. Uh, never remove more or add more one, uh, more than one variable at a time, because remember that every time you recompute uh, a regression or uh, an RDA, the complete set of regression coefficients or canonical coefficients is recomputed because it takes into account the presence of all other variables. So you, you never try to remove or to add two or three variables at a time. Do it always one variable at a time. So with the VIFs, it would be the same. You compute the VIFs of your RDA. You see that you have two or three variables that are well above 20. Don't remove all the three or the four at a time. You remove the worst one. You recompute your RDA and you verify. And sometimes you are surprised. Uh, removing only one will settle the, the issue. It, it may happen. It, it happened uh, to me a couple of times. Now, to, uh, I, I won't take much of your time today. Maybe I'll take a couple of minutes after that to go uh, with those, uh, to present you, uh, uh, to you those slides with, uh, uh, with the, the, the interpretation of an interaction in ANOVA. Uh, I promise that. But just to finish with this uh, selection, uh, this uh, quick presentation of selection procedures, in uh, the choice we have with the, our usual uh, packages, Vegan, ADE, uh, ADE Spatial is a brand new package. It's actually an offspring of ADE4 that now contains the, spatial, the, the part devoted to sp the analysis of spatial structures. It's still being uh, in a process of construction, so expect it to change a couple of times these next months because Steph André, who is uh, the re responsible for, for, for it, uh, still accepts uh, and is, is in the process of integrating many, of the many functions into ADE uh, spatial. For instance, the asymmetric eigenvector maps that we will present to you uh, tomorrow or, or, or on Friday, I don't remember, uh, those are, uh, for now are in an independent package, but they will be integrated in ADE spatial in a couple of months. So, what do we have? We had those, this first function, forward.cell, that had been written by Stefan Dre on purpose for uh, the forward selection in RDA, and especially using uh, the second stopping criterion based on the adjusted R, uh, the adjusted R squared. So for a long time, this was the only function doing it, and this is the reason why we used it very much in these uh, last uh, latest years. Uh, it could not accept factors coded as factors in uh, in RDA in, uh, in in R. So you had to recode the factors in uh, in uh, in Helmut contrast to be used here, and that, that may cause problems in some cases with uh, selection. Any case, anyway. Uh, forward selection uh, can be done in forward.cell and uh, using the second stopping criterion. You have to compute your first RDA, your global RDA first, to be able to give uh, forward.cell the adjusted R square, the complete one, as a second stopping criterion. But it can be done, the code is in the book and in your practicals. And in Vegan, for a long time we had all this step only, which is based on a procedure of selection based on uh, Akaike Information Criterion, AIC. And this was, uh, is actually borrowed from the base of R, so can be done for multiple regression. And um, Yari Oksanen adapted it to, uh, to RDA, so it can be done with RDA. 
and it offers forward and backward selection. It's the only one of the three that offers backward selection if you are interested to, with a, to, to start with a global full model and thin it up until you get something uh, more tight, tightly uh, wound, but uh, not necessarily as parsimonious as, as with forward. And it accepts factors, but it cannot use the adjusted R squared because it is based on AIC and not on the ordinary uh, uh, stopping criterion of the other two, uh, including the alpha, the probability value. And so, after many discussions, cautions, and a couple of years, finally, Yari Oksana wrote uh, a version of this called or the R2 step, which this time works with uh, the adjusted R square, so it implements the second stopping criterion. So now, with all the, all the R2 step in Vegan, you can run forward, but no more backward selection. Forward selection with the stopping uh, Blanchet Guillaume Blanchet stopping criterion, second stopping criterion based on adjusted R square, and it accepts factors as they are coded usually in R. So this is. Your, these are your tools for this analysis. Before I go to my couple of slides devoted uh, to interaction, do you have some questions about what I already presented now to you? No. Okay, we're after lunch. It's warm. People are sleeping up. Well, sleeping. Fine. So... I'll go to that example. Of course, it was, it was made for my undergraduate courses, so uh, it was in French, of course. I had time to translate most of it in English uh, yesterday or day before, or night before. Uh, a couple of words are still in French, but I have put the translation once and for all for uh, in a in corner of the, of the slide. Okay, this is a, so the, the situation is borrowed from an, exam by, uh, from an example by Sokal and Rolf in their uh, statistics book, the basic uh, statistics uh, book uh, called Biometry, uh, which has had a couple of editions. Uh, you have, I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but this is not important here. We are in the, at the level of a principle. There won't be any number in this presentation, just uh, five or six uh, slides here. Um, so this is the layout. You have rats here. See, a couple of rats. And they are fed uh, lard. Lard is uh, pork fat, you know, the one you knew, used to, 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 uh, to make a baking uh, pastry and such kind of things. Anyway, lard. And this lard, in this case, in this experiment, they were fed either fresh lard, the one you would use, or rancid lard, you know, it has uh, been on the counter at uh, room temperature for a couple of days and it stinks and everything. Well, and now, this is our one of our two uh, factors. So, a factor with two levels, factor uh, fresh and rancid. And for the rats, we have a factor sex, male and female. So, the response variable is the number of grams of lard eaten by the rats. And as you see here, we have within cell replication allowing us to test the interaction. I have put three of them. I don't remember how many they were in the original uh, example, but this is not important. Let's say it's balanced, of course. It's important. Three rats or four or two, but the same number in, in every cell. Now, my question is, say you run the ANOVA, and the interaction is significant. What is the biological interpretation? Someone, please give me that. How would you express in one sentence, sentence the biological meaning of a significant interaction in this case? The preference change uh, within the sex. Yes. The preference for or the amount of uh, fresh versus rancid lard depends on the sex. Okay? 
This is interaction. Now, could be the reverse, but more difficult to figure out. Anyway, I built up on this idea. And now, in the next slides, I present you, I'll try to cover just about every possible thing. Of course, qualitatively, quantitatively, it's an infinity of possibilities, but qualitatively, I've tried to cover every possible solution. First pair of slides present you situation when the interaction, interaction was not significant. And all the graphs are the same. So how do they work? Uh, on the abscissa, you have the freshness of the lard. So frais, fresh, rance, rancid. It takes not a, a Nobel Prize to understand French in such a limited case. But I still have put the translation here. Okay? And then, on Y, you have the amount of lard that has been consumed. Could be grams here, grams of lard. Okay? Here, in the ordinate. And the second criterion, the second factor, is the sex. So the males are in blue, and the females in uh, pink. How original. <laughs> now let's go. As you see, first, zero basic situation, null situation, nothing is significant. Because if you average for the two sexes the consumption of fresh, fresh lard you get here, rancid lard you get here as well. If you average out what males consume, you get here. Females consume, you get here as well. So everything is equal for both sexes. So no, none uh, of the two factors are significant. And of course, the interaction is not, because here you have exactly the same uh, shape of uh, relationship, or here in this case, absence of relationship. Uh, males as well as females they eat the same quantity of uh, fat and are completely, uh, well, of lard, and are completely indifferent to the fact that it is fresh or rancid. This is the basic situation. To the, in the right, at the right part here, in the other graph here, you have the two main factors that are significant, but still no interaction. Let's see why. Here, well, I was here, so I'll go here. Here, let's see for the freshness. The fresh lard, on average, if you take the females and the males, the amount consumed with here is here. The rancid lard is here. So there is a difference between fresh and rancid, two sexes considered together. So freshness is significant. Sex, the males consume this much, and the female that much. It's also a difference. So it is significant. But the way males prefer fresh lard over rancid is the same as the way Females prefer fresh lard over rancid. The slope here is the same. Okay? So there is no interaction. Two other cases, still no interaction, but this time with only one of the two factors significant. Here, it's the freshness that is significant because all sexes, or two sexes considered together, uh, the fresh lard is consumed in this quantity and this amount and the uh, rancid one here. So you have a, a, a quite a large difference between the, uh, the, the fresh and rancid lard that has been consumed. Uh, okay? So uh, there is a significant effect of the freshness. No significant effect of the sex because here uh, male and fem males and females uh, behave exactly the same way <coughs> on average. On average, between fresh and rancid, the females eat this much lard, fresh and, uh, freshness, all freshness considered together, and the male, male the same amount. So uh, sex is not significant. And since here again, of course, the slope is the same, interaction is not significant. And finally, for the non-interaction cases, it's the reverse here. So 
uh, as well, males as well as females are completely indifferent to the fact that the, the, the fat is rancid or is fresh, okay? They eat the same amount, but males eat more than females. So the sex is significant, but not the effect of freshness. Okay, you follow? Okay, that was the easy part. Now we go with all the cases. We ha I have five cases with significant interaction. Figure out all the possibilities depending on what is significant or not on top of the interaction. So here, from now on, you always have interaction. The first one is the most exotic case. It can happen. Beware, it can happen. It does not happen often. But sometimes you may stumble upon an ANOVA where the interaction is significant, but none of the main factors are. And this is the case here. Because the effect is exact, exactly opposite between the male and females. So here, if you look at the fact of freshness, you, you would consider that it, it should be significant because obviously males as well as females re react to freshness. Except that, react, that they react in opposite directions and that globally it cancels out. Because on average, males eat this much lard and females this much lard. Fresh and rancid together. So no significant effect of uh, the, the sex. And, of course, freshness uh, does not... Uh, well, uh, it, it's the same with, uh, with the, the degree of uh, freshness because, on average, fresh lard is consumed in this amount and rancid in this amount as well. So everything cancels out. This is a strong example where uh, you, can, you could figure that the females, rat females, are delicate creatures that appreciate fresh lard very much. But rancid lard, well, they don't appreciate it at all. So they eat almost none of it. Why the males are dirty creatures that lift their nose upon fresh lard and prefer good, stinky, old rancid lard? Okay, so this is really the opposite effect. They cancel out, so you have only interaction significance. So if this happens to you, and it may happen, don't throw your analysis away and try to forget you have done it. You may have learned something very interesting about your data. Interesting things in data are always learned when you have unexpected results. As long as you confirm what you already do, uh, what will matter? Okay. Now, second situation. Everything significant, you see? Well, I have to go back here. Uh, here, freshness first. Fresh lard on average here. Uh, I'll go a bit faster. Rancid lard on average up here. So there is a difference. Freshness is significant. Sex, females here, males here on average, both are significant. Meaning that in both cases, in this uh, figure, the interpretation would be that females don't eat lard very much and they are indifferent to, to whether the lard is, uh, is fresh or not. And the males still are the dirty ones of the first example who prefer rancid lard. That example there, it's still significant in both cases, but it's a milder case where you have simply different of... Uh, in a, in a, observe that in all those cases when interaction is significant, you have slopes that differ between uh, males and females. This is the key point uh, to identify the fact that it's... After that, you will have to explain why it is significant in the terms I'm presenting to you now. Uh, but the, this is a common feature of everything we see from now on. So here the soaps are still different, less different than here, but they are still different. So on average, females here, males here, so uh, freshness is significant. And, uh, well... Uh, or fresh, no, fresh here and, and rancid here, so freshness is significant, and females here, males here, so uh, sex is significant as well, and since the, the females have a really a, a good taste for fresh lard but don't like rancid lard at all, while the males are not completely indifferent but still prefer the fresh one, you have still different slopes and interaction is still significant. And for the two last ones, uh, 
I had to think quite a bit to figure out the, the situations here and, and draw them to, to get the results I wanted. To have either one or the other factor significant. So here, look at freshness. On average, fresh lard here. On average, rancid lard here as well. It's not significant. While, if you look at the sexes, you have the females down here and the males up here. So this is a mild case where there is some kind of intermediate uh, taste for fresh lard, but females decide, uh, they, well, really prefer, still prefer fresh lard than rancid one, while the males have the opposite preference here. But this is a milder case of uh, the extreme case where the, the two lines crossed at the beginning. So here we have a sex significant, but not freshness, because on average freshness hits uh, the same point here on the uh, ordinate. And here it's the opposite, because if you look for freshness, fresh lard, you are up there. Rancid lard, you're down here. So there is a difference. So freshness is significant. Oh, yes, it's the last one. I should be here. So uh, here for freshness, you have the difference, uh, a significant difference. But for, for, for the sex now, females on average here, males on average here. So it's not significant. But there's still an interaction because you have still females prefer. In, in this case, it's, it's quite important. The, the slope is quite different here. Uh, and you have, uh, for instance, here, females preferring uh, fresh lard and males prefer rancid lard. Although if on average, rancid lard is consumed in less lesser quantities than fresh lard. So every single of those situations is different. What you have seen now, four situations with non-significant interaction, but different uh, cases with the main factors. And finally, uh, five different situations with significant interaction and various significances of the main factors. But in every case, don't forget that if you have interaction, you cannot interpret the main results as a block. For instance, here, if you do that, you would say, well, freshness is non-significant. My conclusion is that rats are, yes, I, I, I'll come to you later. Uh, uh, rat, uh, I'll come to you. This means that rats are indifferent to freshness. No, they are not. It happens that both sexes are, react to freshness, but in a different way. Okay, so this is why I started by asking what was the first and most, uh, this morning, first and most important result to look for in an ANOVA result. It is the inter interaction test. The result and the consequence, now it's easy to figure, the consequence when, of course, you, you, do, you, you can also, in, in relatively up to two, two three, four, uh, Levels for each factor, you, you may dry, dry, uh, draw those kind of interaction maps to figure out what, what's going on. And it's, uh, uh, you are encouraged to do it in, a, in, a, in univariate ANOVA. But the consequence, of course, here is that if you have such a thing an inter as a significant interaction, it means that you cannot interpret freshness globally. You have to test the effect of freshness separately for the sexes. And you don't interpret the effect of sex globally. You have to, inter uh, to, to, uh, uh, to interpret separately the effect of sex for fresh uh, and rancid lard in this example. Okay, so you have to split your ANOVAs as, long, uh, as soon as you have a significant effect. In the, in the case, this morning, the case I presented with uh, the pH, with the altitude, and the possible interaction, I was relieved that the interaction was not significant. Because otherwise, I should have tested the effect of altitude for every level of pH and the effect of pH for every single separate level of altitude to get a, a proper picture, to uh, account for this uh, interaction. OK? Now, your question. Yes, here. Mm -hmm.
what is not significant is the interaction, meaning both sexes react the same way to freshness, yeah. and freshness acts the same way to both sexes. Uh, you don't see it as relative amounts in this case. What is important here is that uh, each, so that what you are mentioning is, is actually the, the effect of sex. It's not an interaction. This is the main effect of sex that you are describing, meaning, but it's, it's assessed in absolute terms. It's not assessed in relative terms. It's maybe the only point. But you do never, uh, unless you have, for some reasons you may have in completely other designs, you may have variables that are expressed in percents and so on. But even then you may hit into, into problems because of distribution and so on. And uh, this, is the, this could quickly become technical. But uh, of course here we are speaking of real absolute variables measured in grams or in anything li like this. Your response variable cannot be in... Uh, uh, shrunk to percentages here. I understand what you mean, of course, but this is simply not the way uh, ANOVA uh, works. <laughs> like me, maybe for some reasons you may uh, consider that uh, in terms, say, of intensity of metabolism or so, you may devise a completely different uh, way of uh, building such an experience for very uh, valid reasons. And then, in some way, consider uh, the consumption of the energy uh, uh, brought uh, by, by the consumption in terms of, uh, which could be relativized to, to the, the total amount for the, the males and the females. But I would be afraid in this case that you would bias the, the experience at the outset because you already, in your design, you would take a part of the effect between the, 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 the or the main effect of, uh, of the sexes into account. And this would certainly uh, give a totally different fi uh, picture. But then, again, I would not be very comfortable with that. After that, if you want to go back to these results and say, yes, but now this is the brute result with grams of lard cons uh, consumed or uh, amount of uh, calories or whatever you want. And then say, yes, but to be fair, we would have to consider that uh, to, to, to put this relative to the, the male or female's weight. Then you go beyond this analysis and you can still do it. But the analysis itself tells you that in terms of amounts of lard, uh, the reaction is the same. So. Uh, we, we could certainly go further with this discussion. There is something to be done, and of course, it, in this example, it's a simple way of showing how to interpret the outcome of the analysis, not, and possibly the, the brute interpretation you can make, make of it. But then beyond that, it goes to the particulars of every single experience, and I, I can't, cannot go into this now. Now, uh, well, I'm already later than I expected to be, thanks to those rats. And uh, I urge you now to, uh, as quickly as possible, to uh, unless no, Pierre, you didn't have anything else to add here. Okay, let's go. Let's go to the practicals room, and we will uh, uh, now go to get our hands dirty with some R code.